uh, he received his medical degree from the University of Cologne and uh, also we have something in common uh, he also worked in uh, for a year uh, in UAB University of Alabama at Birmingham with Professor Keith Jorgensen uh, on pediatric endosurgery and he received extensive training in the endosurgical and minimal invasive surgical techniques and between 2011 and 2015 uh, he worked as a consultant surgeon at the Department of Pediatric Surgery at Hanover Medical School um, and then right now he is the chief of pediatric surgery at the University of Leipzig. Uh, he is a well-known friend in pediatric endosurgery uh, community. Uh, and right now I will give the word to Professor Murat Chakmak uh, for his welcoming. Okay, we, we talked too much in the beginning, Martin, but uh, welcome to web, welcome to Turkish friends, welcome to Pediatric Surgery Zone. Welcome <laughs> thank to Turkey. You very much. Uh, and thank you very much for your kind acceptance, our invitation, because uh, I think you are working hard. Uh, because of that, thank you very much. So, okay, thank Martin. Um, Go ahead. And thank you, Aydin, for the very uh, kind introduction. It's a, it's a big honor for me to speak uh, in front of you and your society as I have really like a lot of friends from Turkey um, and um, maybe some of them are, are, are watching this too. So um, you asked me to, to talk about diaphragmatic hernia. I, I'm gonna um, share my screen now and hope that you can all see. There is um, in fact a few videos so if the videos are not working well, you just have to give me a feedback and I will, um, we will see what we can, we can do. So Aydin, is, are, are things working? May I start or? Yes, you yes. can start. Everything seems okay. quiet. Perfect. So um, as you all know, CDH is uh, two types. Um, there's the Bachtelek hernia and there's the Morgagni hernia. The Bachtelek is the dorsal hernia, the congenital one. Uh, discovered by a Czech anatomist. And this is the type I'm talking about today. In neonates, um, the, the first descriptions were actually uh, in larger series um, in the middle of the last century by Robert Gross that you all know. And it's um, worth to look into his textbook, how he repaired um, it open. And he's, he said, we are convinced that this operation should be undertaken as soon as the diagnosis is made in the first 48 hours because he thought the patients are more stable at the end of um, a week or um, compared to um, the end of the week and 10 days and you know we we nowadays wait a couple of days until they are more stable but what is even more interesting is actually how they did it um, they crushed the phrenic nerve because they were irritated at that time that if you repair a CDH, um, the diaphragm is moving. And they said, if you put a hemostat uh, across the um, phrenic nerve, that paralyzes the diaphragm for five to six weeks and then the nerve recovers. So I thought that was quite interesting from a, an open technical point of view. Surgical options, you know, you can do a, a, a vertical midline, a transverse, an oblique, that's up to you. And then you can close the Bachtelek hernia easily with interrupted stitches, a small one, or like this patient you see here after ECMO uh, with a cortex patch, that was the one we would use. So after the open repair, um, it took another 50 years um, to take the next step. And the next step was not thoracoscopy, the next step was laparoscopy. David van der Zee from Utrecht, um, the Dutch guy, um, published a paper on a six-month-old child with a um, Bachtelek type hernia, which he fixed from the abdomen by a laparoscopy. And David said the advantages of laparoscopy would be easy reposition of the intestines into the abdominal cavity, and closure of the defect may be easier from the abdominal side. 
It took another six years until um, François Becmeur from uh, France described the thoracoscopic approach in 2001. And maybe some of you may uh, know him. He's a really like a true gentleman and a great speaker. There was a photo I met him on last year in a MIS meeting in Naples where we were talking about thoracoscopic CDH. And he is a very, very um, kind uh, surgeon. In my talk today, I will talk about both the technical aspects of CDH repair and the controversies. And I want to start with the technical aspects. First is positioning of the patient in the OR. You can position the patient at the end of the table, like seen in the upper picture, um, with the monitor at the feet, or you can place the patient in an oblique fashion across the table, and this is up to you. This is the setup you see in my operation room with the monitors at the end of the table. And this is how we fix the patient um, for a left-sided thoracoscopic CDH repair. And of note, you see on the right side of the picture that there has to be enough space for the anesthesiologist to access the patient. For all MIS procedures in my department, we have a positioning book where um, it is uh, written down what equipment we use, how we position the patient, what we need for positioning the patient, um, what the anesthesiologist needs to know, what the scrub nurse needs to know. And I really encourage everybody who is doing MIS um, to do this for every operation. We have one for thoracoscopic CDH repair, one for TEF repair, one for fundoplication. And um, if you, when you standardize this, you have less trouble during the operation. Because as you all know, MIS is a combination of tiny little steps. And even every tiny little step can make life easier or difficult. So the better you are prepared, the smoother the operation will go. This is, I hope you can see a video now, how we drape the patient. And it's important, um, you see on the right side, the anesthesiologist, when you drape it to leave the mamilla free, that when you position your trocar, you don't lose orientation. On the left upper corner, you see the anesthesiologist, and she in that case really has to access the patient, and um, by proper positioning, um, that is then very smooth because during the operation, you need to um, communicate with your anesthetist very well. Then next step is the choker placement. And for this, you have two options. First of all, you should stay cephalate, but for the camera choker, also not too close to the scapula. Maybe some of you have encountered also that if you put the choker right where the scapula is and you angle your choker, that is uh, fighting with the scapula. So stay a little bit away from it. And then the second and third choker and the anterior and posterior axillary line. If you do that, you have this picture with a five millimeter camera and the right and left hand three millimeter ports. We always draw a little cartoon where the head is that we don't um, accidentally um, lean on the patient's um, head. So this is option number one. Option number two is that you put actually the blue Dotted, the blue is where the camera goes in, the camera almost in the axilla, a little below the mamilla, and then the left uh, hand where the scapula is and the right hand in the lower thorax. If you position your ports like this, the corner, um, which is always the most difficult part of the diaphragmatic closure, is a little easier because you access, is access the corner in a nicer angle. Also, don't never be afraid to put another port in. If you think you can reduce the bowel better if you put a metal probe in or another grasper, don't shy away from doing that. It's not about finishing with three trocars. If you need four trocars, you need four trocars. It's not a, a, a problem. Instruments are your three millimeter short instruments. You can have long instruments too. And the camera, I use a five, but you can um, also um, use a three. Then the next step is to reduce the viscera into the abdomen. 
Um, and for this, you should really start with low pressures, uh, three or five millimeter mercury, the max maximum, and very low flow. And to use blunt graspers, you would never introduce a Cali four steps, for example, or something that is sharp because you can injure the bowel. Now you should see a video of a tough patient. You see on the chest x-ray that the left diaphragmatic hernia is really a lot of um, dilated bowel loops in the chest. And then you use your blunt graspers and really get a feel for it um, and uh, go very slowly. The first five to 10 minutes is just get a feeling for the patient and um, slowly, very slowly reducing the bowels uh, loops in to the, in the abdomen. If you do that, you should have actually um, the bowel loops in. You see the bowel loops are very inflamed here. In this case is a neonatal case. And um, after you have put in all the bowel loops, you will see that the spleen comes last. There is a, you see the anterior rim of the diaphragm is actually a very nice lip here. And then um, the spleen should be last organ to reduce into the abdomen. And you see the bowel loops are always popping out. Here, here comes the spleen. And why should the spleen come last? You should put the spleen in last to use it as a cap. And um, if, if that spleen occupies the hole, that prevents the bowel loops from coming out. They're always, regardless, sometimes coming out any, anyway, but they come out last if you put the spleen in last. After the, all the bowel loops are in the abdomen, the question is whether you should cauterize the diaphragmatic edges to create raw edges that maybe um, stick or heal together more nicely and you avoid closing peritoneum to peritoneum. It's no evidence that this helps, but I think it's a reasonable thing to do. Then this is the most or in, uh, not infrequent situation that the spleen is in, but the bowel loops are still popping out. What do you do? Um, there's one trick. You, you put your first stitch at the medial edge of the diaphragmatic defect where you start, and then you externalize this stitch at 12 o'clock. And that creates a funnel, an inverted V, and that elevates the, the lower rim or the medial edge and facilitates with the following stitches. And here you see the spleen that goes in last. You can push it in. I learned the trick from Francois Becker. He just grabs the hilum of the spleen and, and pushes it in the abdomen. It's really like a little dangerous maneuver, but he says it never bleeds. So but I, I, I prefer actually to push it the spleen. And now you see the bowel loops and the spleen, they're coming out. And then you put the stitch outside in for the ribs and take it. It's a ski needle in this case, but it doesn't matter. You can take any needle. This is an antibond, two O's, two a suture, and you come out and just use this stitch as a, as a holding stitch to lift up the lower diaphragmatic rib. The sliding knot is very helpful and you should practice this. Um, also, you have to place enough stitches. They should not be more than one centimeter apart and do not leave any gaps between the stitches. And the most important thing, David Randerze always emphasized that, tie good knots. And um, actually you have to practice every day at home. My juniors, my residents all have such a pelvic trainer. There's a very good company, Laparoscopy Box with two axes. You can put your smartphone or your tablet over it. And um, you should actually practice at home to tie good knots. And I think that's really important to practice every day. These are the suture materials that I use. Introduction of the um, needle is either through the trocar or directly, I like that also through the chest wall because going through the trocar with a needle may uh, unsharpen it and then it's a little more difficult. 
start medial to lateral. And also you can manually compress the chest wall from the outside and that brings the diaphragm um, to the range of your instruments uh, when necessary. Sometimes, you know, it's not very easy to maneuver your instruments to the side where you want to go and that trick may help. And this is another tough case. Um, I'm not showing you an easy case right now. You see the bow loops are still coming out. So placing those stitches in the beginning of the operation can be really cumbersome. Um, also take care not to, of course, um, um, stitch a bow loop or catch a bow loop here. And then you're really very patient and very slowly advance from medial to lateral. You see the holding stitch that I showed you in the other video in the beginning. And these stitches, the closure interrupted knots from medial to lateral, but then replace the holding stitch. The challenge is always the corner stitch. And that's the most difficult one um, because the corner is difficult to stitch and tie. However, in the corner, you have the rib. And the rib you can take advantage of. And these are called pericostal sutures. So what you do is actually you, um, I'll show you a video also later on this trick. Um, you go in with a regular needle and then feed in a proline loop and then go around the, the rib on the other side and then catch that proline loop and pull on that proline loop. And you can even trade that proline loop for an bond loop. And by that you can actually, you see it on the left picture, there is the rib and then the, the, the stitch comes outside in through the upper rim of the diaphragm, through the lower rim, and then outside. And then you tie it over the rib. And by this, it's a very secure suture um, and closure of the edge, and where it's so difficult to get um, to with your laparoscopic instruments. I'll show you another video now, how you can do this pericostal sutures. You realize that this is an easier case. This is um, a patient um, who was six months old already, and there was an incidental finding of left sided hernia, an older child, and then. In this case, the spleen is in already, and this is the um, colon that you push in. Of note, the lung, in contrast, comparison to um, uh, thoracoscopic uh, TEF repair is never in the way because the lung is hypoplastic. There's always plenty of space once the bowel loops are in, and now you start from medial to lateral in this easy case to Place your stitches. I did not draw the edges of the diaphragm in this case. And then you put interrupted stitches. And this is another sliding knot that I mentioned, which is a very nice technique that you have to practice um, to bring together the diaphragmatic edges under tension. And this now is the pericostal stitch. You see one stitch is in already, and you see this needle. And through that needle, a proline lasso, like in an inguinal hernia, you're using a two-e needle. You can certainly use a two-e needle for this maneuver too. And then this lasso catches the athibond suture, and then it is tied over the rib. And this is a nice closure of the edge. So the small defects are kind of easy to close, and these are ideal candidates to start with. But what about these defects, where it's almost no diaphragm and you have to put in a patch? Well, one option is that you convert and uh, it's not a failure if you have to convert. If you start with thoracoscopic CDH repair, you should have a low threshold to convert when things are not going smoothly or whenever you think the repair is not the same quality as an open repair. The other option in a big defect is that you start closing it, like you see here from medial to lateral with silk sutures, 
and then partly close the defect um, that you cannot close with stitches, even not with pericostal stitches, and then sew in a patch, like a cortex patch as seen here. How do you get the patch in the, in the thorax? You have to actually not push it in, but pull it in. You have to advance your instrument from inside out and then grab the patch. And then you see now the left hand helps pulling in that patch and then it's in. This is how you introduce a patch. So let's talk a little bit about the, the data, what's out there, um, whether thoracoscopic CDH repair is better, the same or worse compared to the open repair and where the role is. Well, you can first of all decide whether you want to be an open surgeon or whether you want to be a laparoscopic or thoracoscopic surgeon. However, it is not as simple as this. We recently summarized our experience um, and uh, the evidence on thoracoscopic CDH repair in the current um, uh, journal of um, European Journal of Pediatric Surgery that you can um, also study. And there are basically four controversies that I want to take you through now. Um, and I start with the advantages. What are the really the advantages of arthroscopic CDH repair? There is data that the ventilation times are shorter, that there is posterative decreased pain, um, and there is, of course, as you saw, especially in the second case, good exposure and perfect view. However, the data on that is a little weak. However, there is data on cosmesis as an advantage and on less musculoskeletal morbidity. The Hanover group um, looked in 2009 at thoracoscopy versus thoracotomy um, and the musculoskeletal status and cosmesis in infants 3.8 years after thoracotomy. And they found that um, compared to thoracotomy, thoracoscopy had less scoliosis um, and a better cosmesis. Of course, you would not convert in a, or most people would not convert for thoracotomy in thoracoscopic CDH repair. However, going through the rectus muscle, um, especially in oblique and transverse in, in incision causes um, musculoskeletal morbidity um, uh, too, and um, that is an advantage of the thoracoscopy. Let's talk about something where there's more data, and then is that is recurrence. We asked in 2015 in a study uh, which was published in the JLAST um, what people of the IPEC thought about thoracoscopic CDH repair in a survey and 161 surgeons answered. And these are the contraindications for thoracoscopic CDH repair, which are patient on ECMO, preoperative need for ECMO, persistent right to left shunting, patient's weight below 2.5 kilos, liver in the chest, right-sided hernia, and these are all contraindications. So to just summarize that to the four main aspects, the recurrence is decreased in thoracoscopic CDH repair when there is a large defect, when there is need of ECMO, when you need a patch, and when the liver is in the chest. And there's actually two papers that need to be highlighted when looking at that aspect. There is one <clears throat> paper published in the JPS 2011 looking at over 4,000 patients. And there was the CDH hernia study group. And they showed <clears throat> that the odds ratio for recurrence is 3.6 increased after MIS repair. And there's one meta-analysis published in the PSI in uh, 2015, um, looking at eight observational studies, 288 MIS versus over 4,000 open repairs. And they clearly showed that using MIS, laparoscopy or thoracoscopy, the recurrence rate is significantly higher. And this you have to discuss with your parents and patients. There is another study um, looking at uh, another meta-analysis um, summarizing 10 studies. And they found that the recurrence was 
only increased when they were using MIS when a patch repair was required, emphasizing that patch is a big issue. Third controversy, hypercapnia and acidosis. You may all know this study, which was published in the Annals of Surgery, summarizing the Great Ormond Street Hospital London experience with thoracoscopic CDH repair. They analyzed 10 children and randomized into open versus thoracoscopic. And they had significantly increased hypercapnia and acidosis in the thoracoscopy group. However, of note, they had started with very high pressure, seven to eight millimeter mercury. And the Great Ormond Street group stopped doing thoracoscopic CDH repair at that time. However, other studies could not confirm this. There was a study from Tübingen, in 2012, um, comparing 12 laparotomy CDH patients with a seven thoracoscopy and published in the JLAST, and they found no difference of perioperative CO2 levels. So how do you practically avoid hypercapnia and acid acidosis? I think you need to work with your anesthesiologist. You saw in the pictures that um, he or she needs good access to the patient. And you have to know the CO2 level at all times. The end tidal CO2 is not 7 to 80 out of a sudden. It's not 40 and then five minutes later, it's 80. It slowly increases. And when it increases, you need to be aware of. Of uppermost importance is when the CO2, you need to reduce the bowel loops into the abdomen. Once they are in, you can actually come off CO2. And then the, the pleura stops resorbing this the CO2, and that helps. Use very low pressures, really important, highest five millimeter mercury. The Great Almond Street people used two high pressures and use the spleen as a cap. And we actually set an alarm clock when we are doing thoracoscopic CDH repair that every 30 minutes we are reminded we need to look, the anesthesiologist and I need to um, communicate what the CO2 is. Let's finally talk about patch repair. There, there, the data is not great on that. There are, um, there's one study published in Surgical Endoscopy in 2016 from the Rotterdam group uh, and the Mannheim group. Um, and they advocated dome-shaped patches to be beneficial because if you sew in a dome-shaped patch that decreases the tension both on the diaphragm and the patch. And there was a similar study from Rotterdam, Richard Kaiser published in JPS 2010, also advocating a more deliberate patch use to decrease the tension on the diaphragm. And finally, looking at the data on thoracoscopic CDH repair, it is worthwhile to realize that the recurrence rate decreased over time, which means that there is, first of all, a learning curve of each sur surgeon, but also patient selection. If you look at this um, cartoon of that study um, from the seminars, um, subgrouping the defects into type A, B, C, and D. In the left upper corner, a type A defect may be a perfect candidate for a thoracoscopic repair, maybe a type B defect also. However, in type C and D defects, where you almost certainly would use a patch to close that. These are the toughest cases, and these cases will give you the highest recurrence rate. So patient selection for thoracoscopic repair is really a key factor. So to summarize the controversies, recurrence rate, study of the CDH North American study group, increased recurrence rate after MIS in over 4,000 patients, and a meta-analysis showed higher recurrence rate only after thoracoscopic patch repair. Hypercapnia and acidosis, there's a randomized trial showing hypercapnia and acidosis is an issue after thoracoscopy. However, there are strategies available to decrease CO2 levels during thoracoscopy. And last, patch repair, there is data that dome-shaped patches are beneficial and you should deliberately use patches.
Uh, thank you very much for your attention and hope you find this interesting. Well, Martin, thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Uh, I'm sure that everybody is very happy about this presentation because it gives answers to lots of questions that in mind. But uh, the first question is coming uh, from Kıvılcım, uh, Karadeniz Jerit. She is asking, um, let me find it. Have you compared your neurodevelopment outcomes in CDH patients performing thoracoscopic versus laparotomy approach? Yeah, we have, uh, thank you for this question. So it's a really important question. We have not done that. However, um, we are following up all our patients and I'm doing thoracoscopic CDH repair and thoracoscopic TAF repair since 10 years now, and I did not find any difference in um, the neurodevelopment outcome, like whether they go to school and what, how they do at school and, and so on. So um, I did not systematically do that, um, but my feeling is there is no difference. And there's also a lot of surgeons, a good MAS surgeon that I know who, who are thinking that the CO2 may be an issue in studies, but in um, translating into poor neurodevelopment outcome is not the case. Okay, thank you. There is a question coming from Meltem Kololu. Meltem. Uh, Dr. Laher, thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, talk. I really enjoyed that you included uh, the technical details and tricks. Uh, my first question is about the uh, about a trick, I noticed that uh, you were not grasping the rim of the diaphragm uh, when you were reducing the while you were reducing the bubble. And uh, is there a specific reason for that, or do you think yeah. that you avoid this, or do you think that it's not useful? And the second question is if there's a high placed kidney uh, in a patient with left uh, CDH. Uh, what will you do? Yeah, so thank you for this, um, these two questions uh, and the positive feedback. Um, so I, I never grab the diaphragm really uh, with uh, the forceps when I reduce it. I, I really try to avoid this because I'm always concerned that the pleura and the muscle uh, ribs, if you have a defect in the muscular rim of the diaphragm, it, it, you may come to the point where it's impossible to tie a knot. Then you may stitches, and when you want to put the two diaphragmatic rims together, it tears. So you should like really treat it very gently that the pleura overlying the, the, the muscular diaphragm stays intact. If you have to grab it, grab it super gently and um, try not to rip it. That, that would be my first uh, um, answer. And for the kidney in the chest, I would, I would try to reduce it. However, you have to be sure that it's not torsed. But this would be a situation um, where you have to really think, is this a good candidate for a thoracoscopic repair? If you have to convert late, when you struggle with that kidney, you can still make a very limited incision on the lateral aspect of the chest to fix that kidney. That does not mean you have to open the entire abdomen. So if you are encounter this problem, I've, either it goes smoothly, but if you're in trouble, it's not a failure to make a little in, in, incision to take care of that kidney. Because if that kidney torses or is not well perfused anymore and, and you lose that kidney, that is not worth thoracoscopy. Okay, thank you, Martin. There is a question from Gabriela Jimenez, and she's asking, how do you get out the CO2 from the abdomen? Well, you know, the CO2 from the abdomen um, is resorbed spontaneously and ventilated off. You know, that is the, the, the problem is with, um, with um, thoracoscopic CDH repair is that you're more or less ventilating only one lung. So it is ventilated uh, off and is just absorbed.
but um, um, it just stays there. And once the bow loops are in, I come off CO2 and then it's actually not a problem. By that point, the CO2 needs to go down and the anesthesiologist can then also hyperventilate. And because of the hyperplastic lung on the side where you do the surgery, it's the lung is never in your way. Okay. Uh, Dr. Murti from India is asking uh, a question about the preoperative preparation. Is there any role for the routine bowel decompression? I mean, preoperative enemas. Are you doing them? Yeah, um, it is a good point. I'm not doing it routinely. You could even do it intraoperatively almost because the risk that you perforate the, the, the colon is really low. I routinely do it in gastroschisis, primary closure. Um, so it is, it is a good trick, you can do it. If the colon is in the way, however, usually the, the colon is not the big issue. Um, but if that trick helps you and you think the colon is extra large in that particular case, there is no downside to do it. But if you do it regularly, of course, when you position the patient, I would um, then have that, um, the tube in the rectum or somebody is in charge then only for this task. So you cannot scrub out and do it and then scrub in again. From the start, you need to have some person who is dedicated to this. Okay. Uh, Fatih Akbek is asking, what do you think about laparoscopic repair of CDH? Yeah. Um, I think it is, you can do it. In older children, you can do it. For Morgagni hernias, I do it routinely. There, the laparoscopic approach is the way to go. For the Bochtelec hernia, I find it more cumbersome because going really around the spleen and then I, I, I like also to push the organs from the chest in the abdomen. Pulling them from the abdomen, you can easily tear the bowel loop, then you're into trouble. Sometimes they get obstructed in the, in the, in the defect. Um, so I think the working space coming from the chest is much better than coming from the abdomen. The lung is hypoplastic and you have then lots of space. So I, in, the, in the neonate, I never go laparoscopy. Okay, there's a question coming from Dr. Argun. Argun, Argun. Yes, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Thank you, Mr. Lehar, for the nice presentation. Uh, I think that presentation answered most of our questions, but I still have one or two uh, little details. Uh, first, you uh, mentioned that you use a five millimeter camera trocar. Is there a specific reason for that? Because since the cavity is too small, uh, I think it may be uh, enough of three millimeter trucker or four millimeter camera to see. Is there a specific reason for that? And the second question is about the uh, uh, the drainage tube. Do you leave a chest tube after the operation, or you just aspirate and close? Yeah. Well, thank you um, for these two questions. So. There is no specific reason, as I showed in one slide, you can either uh, use a three or five millimeter chokers. The problem with our three millimeter camera is it is very flexible and our residents always break it. So it gets darker and darker from every month to every month. So, and the five millimeter camera is not so easy to break. So over time, the five millimeter is just a better view. But if you, if you are, have a, a good view with three millimeter, is just uh, perfect because the advantages with the three millimeters, you can switch between the tow cars. So you can put the camera in from a different angle and, and, and place the stitches. So in terms of flexibility, uh, the three millimeter tow car, uh, a three millimeter camera has advantages. The chest tube, no, I never use a chest tube or try to avoid it because um, um, the, the pneumothorax that you have then in the end, it, it, it will resorb very slowly uh, without a chest tube. And especially when I have a patch in, I would avoid a chest tube because that is a, a, a potential source for infection coming from the outside in. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, a question from our good friend uh, Nabil Desuki from Egypt, and he's asking, how do you evaluate and realize that your stitches for repair of intermediate size CDH repairs are at tension? And are you risk and prone to result into recurrence? And do you shift at that time to replace your stitches with a patch? Right, so um, as I said, you have to practice to put the perfect stitch. David Banderze always emphasized, he does not believe that the recurrence rate in thoracoscopic CDH is worse. It's just like not very good stitches of high quality compared to the open fashion. So I'm very comfortable using the sliding knot. And with a sliding knot, I, I get a really a good feeling how the stitches are coming to, how the two edges of the diaphragm are coming together. And when they, they don't, when the diaphragm is not ripping, when it's not vi violated and you, and, and you feel they are with proper tension coming together and you don't need almost any force to close your sliding knot, then I'm very comfortable with it. And then um, I actually will not reinforce my repair uh, with a patch. I know there are people doing that. Also with uh, Stratis or um, other types of patches, I'm not doing this. So um, I think um, proper placement um, of good knots is key. And the sliding knots give you the beauty to observe the approximation of the diaphragm and how much force you need to get a good estimate whether this is uh, appropriate tension or too much tension. Okay. Uh, Burak Tander, uh, he's asking, uh, in case if perioperative failure to continue with the thoracoscopy, which method do you use? Do you go ahead with thoracotomy or laparotomy? Yes. Oh, thank you. That's also an important question. So I go for um, a laparotomy and if possible, a limited laparotomy um, if I have partially closed the defect already. So when it's just the edge where you struggle or the patient gets unstable or for some reason, I try to do a limited um, uh, lateral um, laparotomy. Um, however, in that um, IPAC survey that I cited, um, out of the 161 surgeons from the IPAC, I think there were about 20 to 30 percent that would confer that would convert to the thorax. So to convert from thoracoscopy to thoracotomy is not unheard of, in, and that is what um, a lot of surgeons do, but not the majority. Okay, there is a question from Aisha Parlak. She's asking, do you recommend laparotomy for large defect required patch? due to recurrence? Yeah. Well, thank you also for this question. Um, I almost always start with thoracoscopy if my neonatologist and anesthesiologist feel that the patient is stable enough. When, um, because sometimes in the operation room, I even get the neonatologist in because they know the patient from the first couple of days and there's no reason why a fresh anesthesiologist can take over and do a great job. So sometimes the neonatologist is in the operation room if there is a difficult patient. And if they think the patient is stable enough, I, I proceed with thoracoscopy. If they think that this patient needs to be repaired within 30 to 60 minutes, I go for laparotomy. And then I do a midline lap laparotomy to avoid cutting through the um, um, through the erectus muscle. And I think that helps with the post-operative breathing. But as I said, it's patient selection. If you have a type D defect with a liver in the chest and uh, a very bad lung-to-head ratio, instable patient, maybe still on um, nitric oxide um, and uh, um, uh, unstable patient, then you may um, refrain from going thoracoscopy directly. Okay, Martin, there is another question from Gabriela Jimenez. She's asking, in case of a hernia sac, do you reject it or fold it? Um, I actually fold it. Um, there are very nice techniques for it. 
Um, and that also um, gives you the, the beauty that you don't have to um, go in the abdomen um, at, at the same time. And, um, um, but there is also, there was also the question in the IPEC paper, and um, uh, there were a lot of patient uh, surgeons who res rejected, and, and a lot of patient, uh, a lot of surgeons who, who just folded. So I do like a mattress kind of folding technique and then the sliding knot. Okay, there is a question from Gülnur Göllü. Uh, she's asking, do you have any additional suggestions for right-sided diaphragmatic hernias? Yeah, well, the right-sided diaphragmatic hernias, um, it uh, is not that big of a difference. Um, gentle pushing down on the liver, maybe you need a little more pressure to get the liver down. I would be um, very uh, low threshold to put in an additional instrument, like a metal probe you saw in the video of that older patients. And then I would use this metal probe to really gently push down on the, on the, uh, on the liver because coming from the top, opening like a blunt grasper and pushing on the liver can easily make that bleed. Um, and um, yeah, these, were the, these would be the things I would do on the right side. Okay, Martin. Uh, well, Martin, in our series, also the recurrence rate is a little bit higher than the open repairs. And in your presentation, you stated that the difficult part, the most difficult part is in the lateral edge. But yes. what we observe in our series is recurrences usually occurs from the medial aspect. Do you have such an experience? Well, to be honest, it is it is not what what we see um, because maybe our patient selection is that um, we do not do the type D defects necessarily thoracoscopically. If you have medially almost no diaphragm, of course the recurrence will recur. Um, at the medial side, where you almost have to stitch the patch to the esophagus because there is just nothing there. Um, I think if you if you have the recurrences, a lot of recurrence as the medial side, maybe these are the ones type D defects, which are not the perfect candidates for thoracoscopy. Okay, and there is a question uh, about the ventilatory settings, but. Are you taking care of the babies uh, yourself or a pediatric intensive care unit you have? Yeah, you know, as we both worked in Birmingham, uh, we did take care of uh, the ventilatory setting ourselves. In that setting, in Leipzig, we are not. We have fighted a lot with our neonatologist about different philosophy, uh, permissive hypercapnia and so on. And we just gave in. We're not fighting anymore. They are doing it. And uh, I also know from the largest center in Germany um, that the neonatologists are, are the ones who are primarily taking care of that. So um, I think it's a shame because every resident should also know what is the oxygenation index and what are the parameters that drive the pulmonary hypertension because we all know it's a systemic disease. It's not closing a hole. It's to treat pulmonary hypertension. And um, the answer is our neonatologists are doing it primarily. And it is really a shame that we surgeons are maybe um, then uh, not, uh, not experts anymore in treating pulmonary hypertension, which is uh, very, very uh, important to understand. OK. And one technical question uh, from, again, Nabil Desuki. Uh, do you fold the sack with one-layered stitches or as multi-layered? Well, this is one layer. You, you start and then you fold it. And if you're happy, you just leave it. And if you think it's still everted, like in the diaphragmatic eventration, you put a second layer over it. So it just depends on how happy you are with your first layer. 
Okay, again, Meltem is asking, are you inserting the ECMO canals yourself or the cardiovascular surgeons inserting them? It is, it is the cardiovascular surgeons in Leipzig. In, in Hanover, we uh, did it with the intensive care team together. In Leipzig, it's a cardiac surgeon because the, the ECMO is at the cardiac center, which is a different building. And they, they are very um, fond of doing that themselves. However, I've, I've done that during my time in, in, uh, in Birmingham a lot. And I think it's really also a shame because it is great training for a, a, a resident or a fellow to work under pressure to get that vessel um, dissected out and put the cannula in. And um, yeah, I, I think a pediatric surgeon should be able of doing it. However, if you don't do that every other day, you also lose the skills. So if you have not inserted the cannula in five years, um, I would not be comfortable to just go on and do it. Okay, uh, Martin, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we enjoyed it a lot. Uh, Anna Munter would like to talk. Okay, Munter, sorry, I unmute you. Okay, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, great. Oh, all right. Um, good evening, everybody. That's hey. a very nice uh, talk and presentation, Martin. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. Can I have a, a question and a couple of comments? My question is regarding patient selection. Do you, what criteria do you use to actually predict? the size and the complexity of uh, the diaphragmatic hernia. Do you have any criteria preoperatively? Yes, so that's a, really a key question. Um, we have the criteria of um, ultrasound and we are our uh, radiology department um, is not bad at estimating whether there is a medial rim and how much diaphragm is there. Also, whether there's the liver in the chest. I think the liver, the liver up is the uh, one of the, the key indirect parameters that you may encounter a larger defect. That's what I would say. Uh, what about the stomach? The stomach, yes. If the stomach, stomach is in the chest. Liver, yeah, stomach in the chest, of course, is also in the indirect parameter for a larger defect. The more organs are in the chest, spleen and bowel is just normal, and everything else is indicates uh, larger defects. Well, the and that and, if, and um, these findings, do they alter your decision about whether it's uh, going to be thoracoscopic or open? or um, alter your decision about doing thoracoscopy and prepare yourself for a patch? Yes. So, um, as I said, it is really key to have uh, pre-autoperative settings that indicate that the pulmonary hypertension is not severe. So I would yeah. say the degree of the pulmonary hypertension is key. If you have like persistent shunting, if you have pulmonary pressures that are not below the systemic pressures, if the patient is still on uh, nitric oxide and your neonatologist can barely ventilate the patient or are even of high frequency oscillation, this is, this is not the candidate to play with thoracoscopy. So it's patient safety first. And as, you, as we all know, after closing the defect, the pulmonary hypertension is not suddenly better. So um, the degree of pulmonary hypertension drives the decision which surgical technique should be chosen. Right, and if you put a, a, a patch, I, I was wa wondering because you said yeah, that you use silk sutures for the patch? Well, I, I used silk sutures in Birmingham, Alabama because we had silk, then in Leipzig, we also had silk, but now the company could not deliver it anymore. Now we changed to Athibon sutures. Right. And now I yeah. actually became a fan of Athibon because the Athibon suture is a very nice sliding suture. 
and especially the sliding knot is, is beautiful with an anti-ethibond uh, suture compared to the silk. However, the silk, if you have make three throws over it, the silk uh, closes nicely too. So it's two different institutions and two different uh, suture materials and whatever you feel more comfortable with. Right, the other thing, do you actually um, cauterize the edges of the rim just to increase right. the um, fibrinous reaction? Right, so that was my, um, that was on one of my slides. I th think it's a perfect reasonable thing to do. Um, and um, there's no data on it that there it has an evidence for better healing. However, if you have like almost no rim, if you have plenty of rim, it's nice to cauterize it. But if it, like dorsally, for example, there's almost no ring, rim, I would be very um, reluctant to cauterize this because I would be concerned that I burn the entire rim and then my stitches will tear. And then you almost have to either put a patch in or go around the rib. So um, that would be my answer. Can I just um, uh, make a, a comment, or I, I don't, do you tilt the head down a little bit? Yeah, I do not. Um, uh, when I want to reduce the bowels from the chest in the abdomen, I put actually the head up a little bit to help um, the reposition of the bowel loops by gravity into, into the abdomen. Uh, uh, no, I didn't mean for the reduction of the bowel uh, from the chest. I meant to facilitate um, your maneuvering because sometimes if the head uh, is on the same level uh, with the trochas, you might actually find it difficult to manipulate, especially the corner stitch. So what I do, I tilt the head a little bit down, about 20 degrees, which gives me more space to uh, maneuver. The other thing which you mentioned about the reduction, now what brings me to that is I usually put um, the CO2 on four millimeters and I wait for about four to five minutes and you'll find that actually the intestine has gone down uh, slowly and then you just don't have to push a lot to actually reduce the uh, content of the uh, thorax. Yeah, well, thank you, Munter, uh, sharing your ex expertise. If you have also a, a, a lot of this, so um, I think the head down is a nice trick. As I said, um, with the two options of putting your trocars, when you yeah. put the camera in the axilla, you, you avoid it a little bit. But you're right. If you put the camera at the scapula and use the right, uh, the anterior and posterior axillary line. Um, you are in trouble with the head, so this yeah. is a nice trick that you shared. Yeah, try it, try it. it. It's very, very useful. Yeah, very nice. And then the second, you're totally right, to just wait a couple of minutes. It's, it is as true as a thoracoscopic TAF repair. Just wait a little bit until the lung um, um, is getting atelectatic in the TAF repair. But while um, you are waiting for five minutes, I, I, I let my fellow play a little bit with the bowel loops and get a feeling of the patient. But this is more or less the same, is waiting and getting the, the feeling. But you're right, you don't have to push too much in the first minute and just let the pressure work on the bowel loops um, by itself. Totally yeah. correct Good. and a very important uh, aspect. Martin, thank you very much. I enjoyed your talk and uh, yeah. nice to see you. And yeah, nice to see everybody. I did not expect yeah. to see you today, Munta. So great. Yeah. <laughs> good. good. <laughs> Munta, thank you very much for your uh, for sharing your experience with us. And right yeah. now, Kut Kutai Bahadur would like to ask a question. Yes, Kutai. Good. Thank you very much for the nice presentation, Dr. Lahar. Uh, do you control the vascular structures of liver after reducing with the Doppler ultrasound in case of the right sided hernia or no? Excuse me, maybe I didn't get it. With Doppler check what? Uh, vascular structures after the reducing to the liver. 
Right. Do so you mean the uh, control Doppler ultrasound for the vessels or? The vessels going to which organs? Which? Liver. 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 He's asking liver. about the liver, yes. Liver. No, we're not doing that routinely. So we think if the, uh, if the um, child is making urine that indicates there's no abdominal or the likelihood of abdominal compartment syndrome is not so big and um, we would not necessarily uh, do a Doppler of the of portal vein or some, some, something like this, no. Thank you very much. Well, Martin, thank you again for this presentation and thank you for all the participants for the questions and the comments. Uh, hope to see you next Wednesday with another guest. Uh, I wish you uh, have a healthy and safe days for all. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.